Yeah, we're going to fail and we're going to fail again and we're going to fail again until we actually succeed. You know, who scores that game winning goal the first game they ever play? I mean, it's not the way it works. We all know that. So why are people afraid to fail? In terms of working through your book and knowing your story, of course, uh, willing to fail, the first thing I, I thought was, gosh, you must have lost more money than you've made. Because you do vulnerably share mistake after mistake after mistake. Have you ever stopped and thought, man, I've made a lot of mistakes? I've certainly stopped and realized I've made tons of mistakes and I'm grateful for every one of those mistakes. I truly am. Those were the tuition or I, and I'm still going to get more tuition in my life, right? My education has been learning on the streets by making mistakes, by messing up. I've never actually tried to sort of quantify how much of those mistakes cost me. I think that would start to it's go not down. Healthy. It's not the healthy thing to do, right? No, I'd start to like be like, oh my gosh, wow. Um, to your point of I've, I've lost more money than I've made, I think I've made a lot more money than I've lost because over time I, I've learned, I've gotten lucky that things cumulatively keep growing and growing and growing. Um, so I'm sure there was a point in time when I was a million dollar business and I'd made a ton of mistakes and it felt like I was never going to catch up. But years later, because we've gone through this hyper growth, it's all worked out just fine. I, I love that. Now, I also, I mean, you write it right in the book, but I get the sense you're kind of the internal optimist from your family of origin or, or what have you. So do you think, like for those of us who struggle with doubt or with fear or uh, with playing small or, or all of those things, every entrepreneur faces it, every business person faces it, um, but you just come across as so optimistic. Is that what you think kind of carried you through for the most part? Like, is this just innate to you or was it something that you had to really hone in on and really develop to get through those kind of darker times or periods? Yeah, probably a bit of both, Mark. I think that I, I have a certain amount of just optimistic blood uh, in me, uh, but I think part of it has also been learned hmm. that when I realized, especially in writing WTF, it really was an aha moment for me that I've made so many failures, so many mistakes, but I was grateful for every one of them because I wouldn't be where I am today. Our brands wouldn't be where we are today. Our people wouldn't be where we are today if we didn't make a lot of serious mistakes, but have that learning from them. And so uh, a story I love to tell is Roy H. Williams, who we wrote the book together. And I kept, uh, as we went through the process, I said, Roy, we need a title. And he said, I've written a ton of books. It doesn't work that way. You write the book, then the title jumps out at you at the end. He said, trust the process, trust me. And I said, okay, you're the expert. This is my first book. You've written tons. I'll trust that. And when we looked at all the mistakes that were made and talked about in the book, it was like WTF you know, in many ways. And it was just, wow, willing to fail. The title did jump out. And it helped for me personally in writing the book and telling those stories to see that every single failure was a gift. It was a moment for me of, wow, I wouldn't realize it at the time that it was a gift, but later on I'd see that, wow, what an expensive mistake that led to much bigger growth and profits and so on. Yeah. And how didn't you beat yourself up? I mean, we can, we can pluck any of the stories from the book, you know, in terms of, um, uh, the people that you surrounded yourself with who at the time seemed like a good idea and, and sometimes weren't to the people you surrounded with your, yourself with who were a good idea, but then you quickly, you know, a few years in, you realize it's no longer working to making investments that don't pan out um, and overspending uh, to launching brands and then missing the mark on branding. Like, it's just like, you know, it's the natural, it's the natural path to an entrepreneur, but as, as leaders, as creative as entrepreneurs, we, often think we're alone in this. Like we feel foolish or stupid for having made the mistake and how could we have done this? And this is so embarrassing. And yet it's just the path forward, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's it. It's the path forward and trusting that by going forward, there will be obstacles in the way and moments that we don't like and things that we're embarrassed about. 
but trusting again that we will continue to go forward. I uh, uh, Something that's in the book, we talk about one of our brands, You Move Me, the moving business we got into. Mm-hmm. Since the book's been written, we're out of the moving business. So I noticed gone, it wasn't on the bottom of your website anymore. We've gone from four brands down to three. Yeah. Now, as an entrepreneur, that seems like things have shrunk and how sad and what a failure. Yeah, it was a failure, eight years of the moving business, but we realized it wasn't the right fit for us. We go after happy brands that have a possibility of just wowing the customer. So I'll give you an example. Someone has 1-800-GOT-JUNK come in and haul away their junk. They go, oh, what relief. That pile's gone. Wow, when day painting comes in, paints the room. Wow, what a transformation. Look at these beautiful colors. Shackshine comes in and washes windows, cleans gutters, and so on. And you just go, oh, my gosh, I can see through my windows again. No matter how great our people were with what, with You Move Me, our moving business, at the end of the day, they still go, oh, the pain is still here. Boxes to unpack, things yeah. are broken, things are lost. I can't find stuff, new neighborhood, and so on. And it was a stressful business. And it was one we just couldn't get customers to the level of happiness that we believed was important in all of our brands. So after eight years, we pulled out. What and was, was, what was that decision like for you? So like, like, and, and not, not Brian, you know, CEO or Brian talking to investors, but just, just, I mean, you put time, you put care, you put effort. I can see the investment that you put as a leader into each brand that you try to develop. So that must have, if even if the, you come to peace with this and you see it on paper and you come to that decision, it's not, it's not easy as a leader. No, I, I had always talked, I still do. I talk about my brands as, as babies, as kids in the family. And so to go from four to three, you know, that that's rough. You're like, go someone else, take that kid, so to speak. And someone did. And we hope that they'll be able to do what we couldn't. Uh, we sold the business at break even. We didn't make any money. But how was it for me to let go? It was hard. You know, this is about hard things. That was hard. It was a hard move for me emotionally to admit failure, defeat, to let go. But again, these gifts, failure is a gift. You might not see it at the time, but having faith that there is a gift in the moment of failure and that you'll unwrap it at some point. It has been one of the best things we've done over the last year and a half was let go of that brand to free us up to put more time and energy into our other three brands. And we've grown even quicker than we probably would have if we had you move me because we've been able to focus, but it's also this concept of fit. The Mm -hmm. three brands, when we look at the O2E brands umbrella, ordinary to exceptional. We had one that just wasn't like the others and didn't fit. And getting rid of that brand and all the suffering that had to go with that really freed us up for a, a new level of exceptional. Hmm. It's, it's funny to me that often the hardest decision, you know, the type of decision that you feel in your gut, the one that you're like, oh no, I have to do this. And you're like, I have to do this. I don't want to do this yet. I don't want the conflict. I don't want the work. I don't want the effort. I don't want the fallout. And then you make the decision. In my experience, you make the decision. And if you approach it with transparency and with honesty and with humility, people are very gracious. They're very understanding. Um, No one would hold you to the same scrutiny as, I mean, maybe investors, but for the most part, um, people just understand. People just understand and want to try and help you out like Mm -hmm. have you found that uh, again i mean it's just like it's remarkable how much you list in here but but you would you would potentially know better than i each time that you have failed or have faced that and have been transparent and open about it and worked your way through it i mean have you not found people have just been there to support you yeah people have been there to support us in a much more connected um committed way i think when we admit our failures when we're transparent and they're just like this guy's admitted his mistakes i want to help him i understand it there's no ego uh there or or the ego has been minimized so i think people have been able to connect with us and trust us more moving forward when we're able to be upfront and honest with what's happened and it's something we try and inspire in our teams 
in our franchise owners, in our head office staff at the junction is it's okay to make mistakes. People think, oh yeah, my boss says that. There's just no way I'm fired if I make a mistake. Not with us. As long as someone makes a mistake and says, okay, I own the mistake. They have to step up and say like, I made this mistake and not make excuses. And then say, well, and here's what I learned. Here's what I would have done differently or here's what I'll do moving forward to take the learning from this mistake I made. Think of marketing and advertising. You know, you, people put a ton of money out there in the world, whether it's radio or digital. You never know what's always going to work. But that experimental mindset of being able to have some, some tests, some experiments in the world to see what is going to work. And if something's a mistake and you can learn from it, amazing. What a, what a great endeavor that you, uh, you know, project you tried to undertake to get some learning from. Hmm. So out of the whole book, I circled this one note and I thought, I literally wrote thesis question mark. So you, you have these different notes within and each one, of course, perfectly capsulates, you know, a thought. And so no 23, do you have no 23 memorized? <laughs> You know. oh, not. <laughs> so audacity begins when you start talking about things you ha that haven't happened yet as though they already have, but you must believe in your deepest core that they will come to pass no matter what. And so, you know, in terms of going to the cabin, you know, you, you have this famous story that I've heard from others and I've heard, you know, about the board and, and it's just, it's like this entrepreneur story, at least up here in Canada in terms of um, you know, having the dream board and, ha and being on Oprah, but it starts like in the cabin writing down four years from now, this will come to pass mm -hmm. and then doing it time after time after time. And, uh, you know, I've been able to work through Ben Haggerty's book, um, you know, P personalities and permanent. And, and he even talks about this idea of the psychological studies that speak to flash forward to the future, speak in present tense as if it's happened, your body will react as if it's real, and then you'll put steps in place towards making it happen. But you're like 20 years ahead of the curve. <laughs> yeah. What led you to think that this was going to be an awesome idea? I mean, how did you trip across this? It's amazing, but it really was that one day sitting at my parents' summer cottage, they had a little shack on the water about an hour from Vancouver, and I was in a doom loop. I wasn't enjoying my business life. I wasn't building something I was excited about. I didn't know what I was doing and was at a, a crossroads. And I took out a sheet of paper and I said, okay, enough negativity. What if I could just imagine pure possibility, what that could look like if nothing was in my way? And I started to write down one page, double-sided, the future. I said, we'd be on the Oprah Winfrey show. We'd be the FedEx of junk removal, all these big, bold, very audacious goals of this is where we will go. And I don't think I realized when I wrote that first, what I call the painted picture, I wrote this document and I went from doom loop to pure optimistic, like gave me chills. Like I can see the future. I didn't know how to get there, but I knew where I wanted to go. Hmm. And things started to happen in the world that just, kept me on on a path a path of moving forward towards these big ideas i would talk about them as though they had happened and so one is an example with getting on the oprah winfrey show i had always and still do admire oprah as a leader and a humanitarian and all she's done as an entrepreneur and i said i want to meet this woman and so how was i going to meet her we were going to get on the show we were going to tell our story and the, the goal really in my mind was to give Oprah a big hug. And so I started telling people that one day I'm going to give Oprah a big hug. I'm going to, we're going to get on the show. I'm going to give her a big hug and thumbs up and, you know, just like, Hey, thank you for having us on the show. And so I started to really see the picture in my mind as though it had happened. And your reticular activating system, this part of your mind just helps you pay attention to every decision that you're making on a daily basis that will get you closer to that happening. And so we started pitching the Oprah Winfrey show and it took 14 months of relentless pitching. And we had a fellow Tyler Wright, who I talk about in the book, who kept hammering Harpo studios and just saying like, here's a story, here's an angle. This is who we are. And we never gave up and we made it happen. And it ended in a big hug 
outside the green room when I said to Oprah, you know, can I give you a big hug? She said, of course you can. And um, so I think it is really seeing these things in our mind and knowing what a win is, knowing what success is, how it feels. So when I write a painted picture, I try and attach feelings to it. Mm. It isn't just a, here's the goal, check, but it's seen in my head, like, what would it be like to give Oprah a big hug? And so the more you can see it, touch it, feel it in your mind, I think the more likely the, the you know, I talk about this in the book, the universe conspires to greatness and helps you on that path of making those dreams come true. See, and I love it and I believe it. And uh, I have done it in my own life in, in small ways. But I think what most of us fear more, well, I guess it's really the judgment of others. Of course, we all fear the judgment of others, but it's that like, I'm going to say this out loud. And I think more than people thinking, you're crazy, Brian, what are you telling me? You're crazy. More than that, it's the like, when it doesn't happen, you just look like a fool. You just look like a fool for stepping out on that ledge, putting yourself out there, declaring all these things that you're going to do. Right. And then, you know, some of them happen. It's, it's like when people look back and they're like, the psychics were right. Well, the psychics were right about the claims that came true, but hold on, let's look about the claims that didn't come true. And so how have you, how did you at the time, let's say maybe when you were younger and you were earlier in your career and you're declaring all these things and you're saying, this is going to happen. You rally the team, you have the people, you have the belief, but there's still that circle of people where you just might be a liar. Like it, it may not have come true. Yeah. I mean, I've got this sign behind me that says it's kind of fun to do the impossible. It's only impossible until you do it. And so sometimes you need to, I mean, even I look at the sign behind you, think bold, be bold, say yes. You have to say yes to trying. You have to say yes to, I could likely fail at this attempt, but if I learn from my failure, there's that gift of more answers, more learning that gets me closer to that actually becoming possible. So with the Oprah situation, 14 months of pitching, there were a lot of failures. So you can imagine, I'm telling people, I'm gonna get on the Oprah Winfrey show, I'm gonna give Oprah a hug, and people are thinking you're crazy. Well, okay, you wait and see kind of thing is going on in my brain. And I stopped doing the PR pitching on my own. I got Tyler Wright, who was a young guy who had no PR experience, but had all the energy in the world and was so relentless in his pursuit of making this goal happen that I knew part of it was letting go and allowing someone else to do it and managing his process through making this happen. But he could see what I saw. So he was on a mission and I knew it would happen. And so it's that, yeah, we're gonna fail and we're going to fail again, and we're going to fail again until we actually succeed. Hmm. How many big things in our lives happen the first attempt? You know, who scores that game-winning, championship-winning goal the first game they ever play? I mean, it, it's not the way it works. We all know that. So why are people afraid to fail? That's the big question, I think, is why aren't people willing to have the courage to step up and say, I am going to try and I'm going to keep on trying and I'm not going to care what other people think. I'm going to care about what lesson will I learn from that first failure. So here's an interesting example too. When we pitch the press and we've done this thousands of times, we get on the phone and we pick up the, the phone and we're, we're calling someone and saying, we've got a great story idea for you. And the journalist on the other phone, on the other end of the phone says, yeah, it's not, yeah, thank you, but no thanks. We ask a question. We say, well, what don't you like about it? Or what is missing? And we're not trying to sell them or convince them. What I want from that journalist is, you know, it's just missing this, this, and that. They give us the answers in that failure of a no that we can then use with the next journalist. And so someone will give us the, the ingredients that we need for that next sales pitch to understand, as all journalists think very similarly, what makes a great story, an element was missing. Let's figure out what that story now needs and pitch it differently the next phone call. Mm -hmm. So failure is an ingredient in success. It's got to happen. Don't be afraid of it. And 
say yes to some risks. <laughs> I think, I think we should. I mean, listen, the, the whole, my whole mission here is to help those of us who dream realize that we can move to the other side of it through bold action, but it takes faith. And, and this is something I've seen in you, you know, like in terms of getting the phone number, right. You tell a great story about the fact that, you know, I mean, you've named and branded your whole company 1-800-GOT-JUNK around a phone number that you couldn't get the rights to. <laughs> I mean, talk about bold actions. So are you, are you, are you, do you naturally lean on the, I mean, we've talked about optimism, but do you naturally lean on the confident side of, I wouldn't say hubris, but on, on the confident side of things? Because you've, again, taken some bold action, hoping they would work out. I don't know if it's the confidence that's there, but it's the trying to think differently. And, you know, Roy Williams, co-author on my book, he says, um, let's build this rocket ship while we're flying it. And so much of what I do in this world is I go, okay, we're, we're launching a rocket that isn't ready to be launched, but we are going to build it while we launch it. Like, let's just do everything and, and get this thing up in the sky the best we can. Let's make some mistakes. So with the phone number, I went out and hired a design company to design the logo for 1-800-GOT-JUNK, ex exactly the way it looks and, and stands today before I had the phone number which most people would say that is just ridiculous. That makes no sense. But that's part of me flying the rocket ship and building it at the same time where I'm just going, part of me getting that phone number, I'm so determined to get something I don't have. It's not confidence in necessarily that I will get it. It's part of the process of going in order for me to get it. I have to see it. People around me have to see it. So let's get the logo designed and figure out how we're going to get that phone number so that it, we can actually. Is it like the pressure the you love? Is it like, is, does it put you in such an uncomfortable place or such a place of pressure that there's only one chance to make this work? Or what is it about that approach? It's interesting. I don't think it's the pressure. I think it's just part of making the future happen. Start by imagining it in my mind, but help others see what I see by doing things that might seem crazy, like design the logo first cost us two grand. It wasn't the end of the day. Now, a lot of money at a small size of business as we were, but I was so determined to get that, that I'm just like, I was taking steps forward as if we'd already had the number. And I think that's where the, you know, it sounds airy fairy, but the universe conspires to help you meet your plan when you start taking bold actions in that way. I love it. I love it. Now I'm, I'm curious. I worked through an exercise um, a few months ago, uh, I have a friend, oh, I mean, you know, uh, Evan Carmichael wrote a book, uh, Built to Serve, and one of the exercises that he has in the book, um, which aims to help people really dig into the past pain with the suggestion that if you're built to serve, as we believe most humans are, right, you're, you're built to serve, you're, and your past pains, your deepest pains are, in fact, your, the greatest things that lead to purpose, because you can go out and help people who have suffered what you've suffered in the past. You're on the other side of it. Uh, sure. But he has this exercise where he looks at, at movies and films and it's like, think about your favorite films, think about your favorite movies, think about your TV shows and the music and the teachers you loved. Mm -hmm. And so when I hit the part of the book where I was like, these three movies, right? We have Willy Wonka, we have Peter Pan, and I apologize, I can't remember the third movie. Yeah, Dr. Doolittle. Dr. Doolittle. Yeah. And I was like, I, I loved it. I loved it because most people don't realize that we gravitate towards the stories. Um, and I've spoken since over the last few months to a, a ton of entrepreneurs asking this question because, you know, you speak to a, a female entrepreneur and she says, you know, growing up, Gone with the Wind was my favorite movie because I loved Scarlett O'Hara's, you know, courage in the time and standing up. And it's like, I, you know, so for you, I mean, man, what was it about Willy Wonka that you loved? Because I, I loved, I grew up loving the original, but it scared me. It terrified me. It wasn't like, it wasn't magical. It was like, what kind of world is this? So what did you love about that? I just love the, the creativity of the, the imagination and the invention and, and creating something that no one's ever created. And so behind the bars of that sort of, wretched old factory inside was just pure magic. And uh, I think it's the way my mind works. It's just imagining big things in such a way that 
you never know, they might actually happen if you just start with that imagination in your mind. And uh, I just loved how um, Charlie in the actual chocolate factory, his just curio curiosity, his personality of just pure wonder and amazement. You know, that's the way I've always been very curious in life. And I always see optimism in everyone and everything. I see pure possibility and that movie represents that. I love it. I love it. Have you, have you watched it back recently or, or is it something oh, I've watched back it? To? Yeah, I've watched it a ton. I mean, it makes me want to watch it again right now, but my, <laughs> my youngest of three kids, uh, we've watched it recently and he loves it. And it's just, it's, it's all those movies like wizard of Oz. I would, I would have probably, <sighs> that was my it. favorite oh. growing up. I watched it the, I, and I still speak about it. Like the moment, because I mean, I love the idea of this woman living a small, scared life, being mm -hmm. able to take that step. But the moment I can remember it, I was five, when the door opens and it goes from black and white to color mm -hmm. and she steps out into this magical world. And it's just like, I, I love it so much. I love that movie so much. It's just, we all can step out from that black and white world to color if we just take the step. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a neat question that you ask on, on movies, because I do think that people, you know, one of the questions we often ask people in interviews is that we'll get someone to pull out a sheet of paper and write down three people that they admire in the world, living or dead, and why. And you read these responses and you realize that that's what people see in themselves. They admire those people because those people are like them. You know, they admire the love, the caring, the leadership, whatever it is they're talking about of their grandparents or some mentor. And uh, same sort of thing, I think, with movies is you can look at in someone's persona and be like, wow, OK, I, I, I just learned a lot about you by understanding what movie uh, makes you uh, sort of nostalgic and sort of strikes a chord with you. Yeah, it's it's so interesting that because because we do all self-identify like like all of our tastes come from somewhere within us. And so the things we like and the things we don't like, the things we gravitate towards or, or not, all must be just deeply rooted and, and speak to who we are and what we want to attain to be, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I know. I know at the end of your book, you mentioned the people who you admire the most. I mean, but, but for you, who are they? You know, I, people I admire the most in the world are people that no one knows. You know, people often say like, who's been the biggest mentor in your life? It's often people that if I mention names, people would be like, who's that, right? Uh, like Mr. Dodds, my grade three teacher in elementary school. I wrote Mr. Dodds after I talked about him in the book. I, uh, I sent him a copy of the book with a letter and I got the most wonderful letter back from him. He's in his eighties now. And he goes, you know, I always thought something would happen with you in a good way that you'd, you'd turn out okay. Cause I was the disruptor in the class. I was the class clown. But what Mr. Dodds did differently than any other teacher I ever had was he saw something special in me. He believed in me, didn't know what it was, but there was something there. And he gave me some love and support and direction in a way that no other teacher did. My other teachers saw me as, ah, oh, Brian, if you just control your behavior and stop goofing around, quit being the class clown, you know, it, it pissed them off. Whereas Mr. Dodds, it brought a smile to his face and he's like, this kid's a good kid. He's going places. So people I admire are generally people in this world that are just normal people, but they've just, they see something in someone that others might not. And so I try, when I mentioned to you earlier, I see I'm an optimist and I see possibility in everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. And, and I think one of the things I love about what I do as an entrepreneur is we have a, a family of franchise owners throughout our three brands. We have a family of staff, a team, people that are pouring so much passion and love into what they do. And we get to believe in them. And they get to believe in us and our vision, our painted picture. And it just, it works together like magic. Hmm. I, I love that so much. You know, when I, um, so I started my business, I worked for a franchisor in franchise development, marketing and knowledge, um, knowledge management. I produce content. And then 2006, I decided to start my own company. Um, and uh, at the five-year mark, I sent five handwritten letters to the five people that I thought influenced me the most. Yeah. And then at the 10-year mark, I picked 10 people 
um, in December, I hit 15 years. I think maybe I should, maybe I should do that again <laughs> because the responses I got back from people, um, just from taking the time to send them a handwritten note was so huge. And I wanted them to realize that, that the impact that they had on me, um, and that also I wasn't arrogant enough to think that I had done anything alone because so much of this is the people you surround yourself with and the lucky breaks that you get and the help and the assistance and people tossing you a bone and all of those things along the way, right? It's important to thank people. And I was just making a note there. You know, I tried to practice what I preached in my own book of, of saying, you know, if, if someone who's made a difference in your life is still alive, like, go tell them, go thank them. And when I sent that book and letter to Mr. Dodds and heard back from him, I mean, it was the most amazing letter. Like, I never keep letters and I'll keep his forever. So I think it's really special when we are here to serve. I, I believe that. I believe that as a leader in my business, I'm here to serve everyone else and that the leadership chart is usually needs to be flipped. You know, they, you always have the CEO and founder at the top. It's really, I'm at the bottom looking up, helping to support everyone else. And I think the best way I can support is to encourage and to believe in others. And uh, so I believe in, in what you're saying and what Evan Carmichael says, like we are here to serve and what better way to uh, serve than to encourage others to thank the people who've served them. So the impression that I've got in terms of knowing your story and speaking with you now and reading the book is that um, everything, and what I'm hoping you'll tell me, this is such a leading question. What I'm hoping you'll tell me is, yeah, because I'm like, I'm like, how do I get him to reassure me? Because that's really what we're looking for. I think people are just looking for reassurance or trust that if I take action A, it will all work out in the end. Mm -hmm. And what holds us up is I'm going to do this. This is my one shot. I got one shot at this. This is what I'm going to do. And, and then I do it and it doesn't work. And I go, well, that was my one shot. But, but what is so clear in your story and what is so clear for people who are quote unquote successful because they simply don't give up along the way is like, it's not just one shot. At least it shouldn't be. Life is very long, God willing. Um, you can make mistakes and have amazing comebacks. You know, we're, we're both up here in Canada. I mean, I assume you're still up here in Canada. I know you're born in America, but, you know, I think of John Tory, um, who's a local politician that most people around the world won't get. But um, John Tory was an amazing man who wanted to go into politics and couldn't, couldn't get his seat, couldn't be the premier, lost. Three years later, he's the mayor of Toronto. And it's like, if you measure the moment where he lost his provincial political career, he's a loser. He gave up everything and he lost. Three years later, he's running, you know, he's the mayor of the largest city in the country. So is he a political loser or is he a winner, right? Like by shifting his, and so I've always thought of him as like, depending on where you're looking on the spectrum, someone is either a loser or they're a winner. I'm interviewing you as a winner, but there's been many steps along the way where you may not have felt like that. And so all I'm doing is just trying to get you to say, just, just it'll all work out. Don't worry. Don't worry, people. Just take action. Just make mistakes. It'll all work out. Is that the case? How do I answer without giving you exactly what you might've been looking for and leading it? No, <laughs> I, I, you know, Mark, I think that the answer is this. I've realized over many years that the goal I'm chasing, so we talk often about becoming a billion dollar business. That makes me sound like I'm all about money. I'm quite the opposite, but that's just a measurement of like, did we build something of real significance, like a billion in sales? We're more than halfway there. I guarantee when we get to a billion, I will probably be the, I will be most uh, underwhelmed by it of anyone in the business because I already see us there. I'm already playing that out in, in my mind, but it's the journey to get there that's the most exciting part. Mm -hmm. So again, going back to failure, if I didn't take some risks and continue to, those are the moments that I enjoy the reward of, wow, we took some risks, we worked hard, we made lots of mistakes. When you talk about the good old days in life, it's often all the 
missteps and problems we had that made life interesting and the reward of we did it, we got out of that problem. And so I think that it's, it's a hollow victory if you end up winning without all these failures and challenges along the way. And so I think if people can, can, at least it worked for me, was realize that it's the journey that is the most exciting. So when you talk about John Tory, he, I'm sure, had, has had, up until his becoming a mayor of Toronto, a lot of moments of ups and downs, but he's probably enjoyed them all. He's enjoyed the learning from them. And so how do people sort of shift their mind to go, let me just be all in on the journey and trust that I will get to these wins. It's not one shot. It's never one shot. Nobody gets just one shot in their life, but it's all those moments towards enjoying the journey that you've got and how awesome it is. I mean, I can take the pandemic as a, a moment in time of, you know, little over a year, year and a bit. that has been really hard for a lot of people. But there have been so many gifts in this for me. Like tragedies aside, with all the heart heartache in the in the world, there's been some interesting things that this has put upon the world, and it, it's changed the world, and it's changed me. And it's embracing those moments, and just going, no matter what's going on, this journey is pretty amazing, and and having a huge amount of gratitude for the journey and where it'll take us is uh, is what makes life. So worth living. So as you, as you think back, what is one of the hardest things that you had to face? And 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 I'm, because because obviously you do reflect and you do ruminate on these things and you do take lessons from them. I'd, I'd be curious what you learned from that moment as well. Yeah, I think some of the hardest moments uh, have a pattern for me, and that is making tough decisions that affect someone else personally. So whether it was Cameron Harold, who I was the best man in his wedding, and after going from two million in revenue together to 106 million, I tell him, you know, you're no longer our COO. Uh, watching Cameron cry, being on the other end of the table, the the shock and surprise, and how he felt and betrayal, and you know, we've worked through all those things, and we we talk all the time, and we're great buddies, but that day was a really hard day, not just for Cameron. It was hard for me pulling the trigger on that. When I had to fire 11 people from my company, my entire company, uh, five years into my business, mm. letting those people go, that, that's hard. So, so I'd say the pattern for me is anytime I've had to get someone out of the business who's been an incredible giver of the business to the business, but maybe they're the, the wrong person for this next chapter, as a CEO, you've got to make some tough choices, which effectively are the right choices to take care of the whole team of hundreds or thousands of people. Sometimes one person uh, feels blamed and, uh, and it's hard letting people go because while people say, oh, it's just business, it's not just business to them. It's not just business to me. And you're sort of ripping someone's heart out where Cameron would say it was the right decision for both of us. He got to a better place and bigger steps in his life as a result of me pulling that trigger, but it, it doesn't make it any easier when you're in the moment. So I think those are the hardest decisions are ones that directly impact people. So how do you approach these types of things now that you have age and wisdom and experience? Yeah, so one of the things I do, it's a, it's a little thing, but it, I think it has an impact is, Whenever we let somebody go, um, I reach out and I make a phone call and they might not take my call. And even though I didn't really know them in the business because our company's grown to such a level, I still call to say, thank you for your service, for everything you've done. I hope you're doing okay. If there's anything we can do to help, like I try and have a connection with them. And, and most people call back uh, or send me an email and just say that, you know, they appreciate it. And it's a hard time, but they'll get through it. And, so just connecting with them as a way to, to, to thank them and recognize the good work that they did do. Um, often people are just in the wrong seat or the wrong timing or something's going on in their life that hasn't made it a good fit anymore. But giving them the, the appreciation that they deserve um, makes me at least feel like I can sleep at night that we've, I've said my piece to that person. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of people, I mean, we have people come back like you wouldn't believe. 
that's a bit of a phenomenon in our, in our company that we'll get people that have left for a few years, come back. They might have been fired and invited back. Like it's, it's interesting how often that's happened in our business because of, I think, how we approach those personal relationships. That's really cool. That's a, that's a cool byproduct of it that, you know, in the world of, well, I can't reach out because then I'll be blamed or then it's liability or I'm admitting like, you know, people around these sites of subjects get so hush hush and corporate and, and, and everything. And it's, um, it removes the humanity from some really tough life moments. Yeah, it does. I mean, you know, too often we're used to in this world, the letter that goes out that says, you know, so-and-so has left the business to spend more time with family. Like, come on. Right. And I get that there's legal sides of how much you can say publicly, but at times just reaching out and connecting and being human, I think is incredibly important. You know, when we had uh, during COVID, you know, like everybody in the world, you know, you, you knew people in the business that ended up contracting COVID and people that I didn't even know other than they were an employee in the business. But I, I would make phone calls just to say, are you okay? Checking in anything we can do. And I did it privately and didn't know that anyone was even aware outside of that person that I did this. And, um, I had a guy, Jay Ho in our company interview me for his podcast. He's in our business, but he's got, he's done really well with the podcast. And he goes, I love that you reach out and everybody who's ever had COVID in the business that you found out about, you reached out to call them and see if they're okay. And I'm like, how'd you know that? And he's like, the word's just gotten out because that's the right thing to do. And so I'm telling you not to uh, more because we're having this intimate conversation, which I get, yeah, yeah, yeah. but just to say, sometimes it's the little things that you do that you don't even realize someone's aware of that makes a difference in how people feel treated. Hmm. And one, one last area that I'd love to circle around on because it seems to come up a lot is the idea of hunger, right? The idea of, you know, young, when you're younger, you may be hungry in business. Um, mm -hmm. Why I think you speak about Tyler, your, your PR man, you, you speak about how hungry he was. Mm -hmm. um, when you tell the story about the moving company um, potentially not working in markets where 1-800-GOT-JUNK worked was because the franchise owners were thinking more like investors and less like hungry entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And so when you're looking for these hungry people, it almost, and, and I've noticed this myself, you know, so I'm 38 now. I started my business 15 years ago. Let me tell you, when I was 23 and I quit my job and my wife and I had our one week old baby and she had no income. And, you know, I only made $18,000 in my first year and the government put me on social assistance. Cause they said, how can you live in Toronto and live on $18,000 a year? I was hungry. Right, uh, right. I can tell you today, I'm not as hungry as I was. I am looking more as investor. I am looking more for passive income. I just, I don't want to work as hard. How do you keep how do you keep finding those hungry people and how do you keep them hungry and how do you keep yourself hungry? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think hunger is relative. I mean, at, at later stages in life, as we all age, I think that hunger changes. And so my hunger showed up in my twenties and thirties at just going 24 seven, like all hours, whatever it would take to just talk business, work business, do business. Like it was, and it was too much. And so I've, I don't think my hunger has gone away. It's just changed. Mm -hmm. So I have a hunger in a more balanced way for my personal life, for my health, for my family. And so there's, there's different hunger, but as a, as a human being, I am as hungry as ever, but just in, in different ways. And so I think finding people that are hungry, it's a cultural thing for us. I mean, you can see it in someone's eyes. You can tell if they're excited and fired up about your vision, your painted picture, your why you're building the business you're building. And so that fire in their belly is such an important part of, uh, of the hunger. And so it's someone making a difference in this world and knowing that this is the place for them right now to help make that difference. So I think you can ask someone about how hungry they are. <laughs> And get them to talk about that. You know, what are you hungry for in life right now? And I think when someone ever, if anyone ever answers that question, starting with money, to me, that's, you know, the biggest red flag in the world. 
money for what? What would you do with that money? You know, what are you really truly hungry for? Money doesn't buy happiness. What is it that you're looking for? And so I think understanding someone's hunger is uh, a really important thing that we should all be as human beings connecting on. So now that you've found more balance, I guess, at this age, do you think you could have built what you built at your, at your current level of hunger? Or does it really take for the entrepreneur, for the creator, for the leader who wants to hit that exceptional level, that extraordinary level, does it take the amount of work, the amount of focus, the amount of hours, the amount of risk that you put into it? I don't think it's an hours game. I think it's doing the right things, leading the vision, the culture. I was working way too much in my business at a younger age when really my job as a leader and what I'm gifted at is driving the culture, creating the vision, uh, landing big opportunities. And, and I needed to spend more time. Of course, in the early days, I had to understand the business. So I needed to be in the, in the trucks those six years. I needed to be on the phones, answering the phones in the call center. Um, those were very important, but I probably put in too many hours on a daily basis where there would be diminishing returns at the end of the day. Once it starts to get too late in the day, you're, you're actually so tired and mentally out of it that it isn't necessarily the right thing for the business. Now, sometimes we don't have a choice because we can't find someone else, but I, I didn't work as smart then as I do now. Hmm. I love it. Last question for you, if I can. For you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Possibility. You know, it's hmm. inspiring big possibilities in others. It's being hopeful in the world. It's being optimistic. It's, it's knowing that we can accomplish the impossible. Like it's, what are those big, bold things that people can dream of that they could see happening in their life or in our business? And, and then driving towards them. And so I just love, you know, again, back to my movies that I, I've chosen. I just love when people dream big and just like, can you imagine what the world could look like if this happened, if I did this? So it's honing in on like, what's that, what's that why? What's that reason for being that if we could make some really amazing possibility happen, what is it that's going to to push us forward and, and keep us hungry. You know, I think that's my, my closing thought is when you say, how do you find people that stay hungry? Find people that have an appetite for some, for some sort of greatness. Do you know what I loved most about connecting with Brian? I mean, apart from the fact that both he and Cameron Harold, the COO he mentioned in the interview are kind of like Canadian entrepreneur rock stars. And I've actually looked up to Brian for years, but more than any of that, is how he focuses on surrounding himself with doers who have the right energy. Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, every single failure is a gift. You may not see it that way at first, but on the other side of that failure is a great lesson learned. And it will make you smarter, it will make you stronger, it will make you wiser. Number two, face your faults and failures. You're going to fail, it's going to happen. But people are more likely to support you when you're open and when you're honest with them. And number three, your future goals have already happened. Start getting a clear picture of what your bold goals look like and act as if this future vision has already happened. You'll start to feel more optimistic and intentional about everything that you're doing. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice of fear that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, you've got to face the difficult, the scary, and the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we're not just dreamers, we're doers, because we do hard things. If you need to learn how you can put money to work for you to pay down debt or to get financial freedom, you've got to hear how this expert breaks it all down. Click on the video right over there for that real inspiring conversation.